I'm Jordan Stewart. Uh, I'm a member of Austin DSA. I'm on the leadership committee as the electoral coordinator. And tonight I'm going to be talking about the Prop B vote. Uh, obviously, we know Prop B has to do with inequality because it's a class warfare uh, by the rich to push homeless people out of Austin so they can make it more of, the, of their exclusive playground. However, what, uh, what I really want to talk to is the inequality of Austin itself and the geography of how this vote went and what it says about our organizing uh, landscape and the difficulties we might face or the challenges, but also maybe some of the things that it uh, brings to light and illuminates. So I guess we can go to the next slide. Okay, so it's kind of in three parts. First off, I'm gonna talk about the Prop B vote. Uh, wanna know like who really voted for this? Uh, we know who supported it vocally online. Um, it was a coalition of right-wing ghouls. However, uh, when a proposition wins, even in a low turnout uh, city election, when a proposition wins by you know, 15, 17 points, there's definitely more than Republicans voting for that because the you know, last couple of elections, there's only been like maybe 20% of the Austin's entire population uh, voting Republican. Um, and uh, so we wanna get into that, talk about the ghouls behind it. Uh, and then after following that, I wanna talk about the like more of a historical perspective on why Austin is so unequal. Uh, you might notice that like, while a lot of the uh, voters and donors to this campaign live on one side of town, uh, a lot of the uh, homeless encampments and a lot of people who voted against it live on the other side of town. And then also like how that uh, history of segregation and economic inequality that was built into the city uh, factors into today's uh, current accelerated gentrification pattern of displacement, gentrification, rich people moving in, pushing working people out of Austin neighborhoods. And then finally, uh, I want to talk with everyone about the path forward. Where can we go from here knowing what we know now? I think, you know, there's different schools of thought and organizing and who you should organize with and reach out to. And I think this vote uh, really sort of like uh, shows some of the fault lines that exist among people that, you know, um, in our two party system all vote under one party but have uh, turns out radically different politics when it comes to uh, you know unleashing police on homeless people or making it easier for them to get housing. Um, it's definitely a two way cho uh, two uh, two way choice there so uh, next slide Subu. So. Uh, First off, we're going to talk about the map. This is the map of, of who voted for Prop B and who was against Prop B uh, and what this map tells us. And uh, feel free to, uh, as I show the map on the next slide, uh, feel free to uh, like throw on a, uh, throw on some things in the chat uh, if you see anything here that sticks out to you. We have I-35 going down in the middle of the city. I don't know if y'all, can y'all see my cursor? Yeah. Okay, so um, never mind that then. I won't be pointing, but uh, so yeah, just uh, as uh, Alex mentioned in the chat, there's a trend between East and West that that's very true. In fact, you can uh, pick out, I didn't put the highways on here for a reason. I just kind of wanted to just show the directions, but you can see sort of a curved boundary between the Prop B vote uh, that was really strong and then most of the rest of the city, that's Mopac. Uh, you could call it, I'm sorry, calling that the Mopac curtain. Um, and like, I didn't get one of those maps for this presentation, but um, in the primary election, a lot of that blue area uh, was where, you know, Bernie and Warren uh, won big, um, uh, Richard asking if we have a turnout map. I do. It'll be on the next slide and we can actually go to that. Okay, so here we go. On the left, the Prop B vote. On the right, the turnout map. Uh, you can see a very similar pattern here. On the west side of Austin, much wealthier, a much higher turnout, much more engagement in a municipal election. Uh, in the uh, last time we had a vote like this in Austin was the uh, Uber Lyft regulation vote that we won. Well, we meaning people who are against it. Uh, but however, it, it still faced stiff opposition from downtown and West Austin, and there was a very similar turnout pattern. It just so happened that like, in this case, uh, we got such strong opposition or support, opposition to the homeless Austinites op and support for Prop B in West Austin that it basically overwhelmed the rest of the city. Um, but most indications, if it were just east of Mopac that had decided this, Prop B would have failed. 
even with you can, and you can see in the middle of Austin there there's two really dark red areas that middle one is downtown and rainy street no surprise there uh, you'll see on the next on a future map uh, the income level of downtown is much much higher than anyone may even realize and that other one is a neighborhood called uh, Brickwood and Pemberton Heights which is a enclave of kind of older money wealthy homeowners that is literally right across Shoal Creek from West Campus and then um, as you go east there, uh, you get into a part of Austin where it seems that there's much more of a progressive mindset among the uh, almost entirely democratic population there uh, versus West of Mopac where Biden still won two thirds or three fourths of the vote in a lot of those precincts, but almost all those people came out and voted again, uh, voted for Prop B. So we can, uh, and also you'll notice on the election turnout map, there's a big light green area in the middle of Austin. Uh, that is West Campus. There was not a polling space in, on UT campus. And I was out there on May 1st on election day and there were you know, students standing in line for an hour uh, waiting to vote. So that is the result of, an, of students standing in line for an hour all day on the only day they could con, um, conveniently vote. Uh, and so there were some issues here too where only three of the early voting locations were east of 35. If you look at that map, there were only three early voting locations for many of the precincts that uh, rejected Proposition B. Okay, next slide, please. Here's the ghoul. Welcome to the Austin Ghoul Tour. We're going to go on a spooky journey of who was really, really behind this uh, this proposition. Okay, so the, the donor list was um, infuriating to me. Uh, there is a number of logos on there for venture capital firms. I've highlighted aerial investments because they cut a $200,000 check to the Prop B campaign, pretty much matching what the Homes Not Handcuffs uh, campaign raised uh, for the entire election. Uh, Save Austin Now was the organization uh, cobbled together by the guy on the top right. That's Mac Bakoyak. He is also known as Boss Baby and the chairman of the Travis County Republican Party. They ran this campaign out of their office. Uh, on the bottom left is our great governor, Greg Abbott. He, of course, was vocally supportive of this bill and it has made opposition to the existence of homeless people in Austin as part of his coach culture war, not to give them housing, but to sweep them away. Uh, and then uh, there's a number of uh, any logo you see on here uh, had an owner or CEO uh, donate at least a thousand dollars to this campaign. Uh, one that you might see disappointing is one in a million. Uh, Juan Meza. I want that handshake back from a decade ago. Uh, I pretty disappointed in that, but not surprised because he also opposed the pay sick leave ordinance. And you start to see a pattern here. There is a sort of a centrist business and far right wing Republican alliance that is merging against um, our more progressive politics as a reaction to the recent gains we've made at City Hall. Uh, four different car dealership owners cut $10,000 checks. Uh, and then that guy next to the Palantir logo is the founder of Palantir, who is a new resident in Austin and was one of the most vocal supporters of Proposition B. He has $425 million. His name is Joe Lonsdale. Anyway, um, now we can go to the next slide. The Democrats, here they are. Yes, uh, on the right is the percentage of the vote uh, for Beto O'Rourke in the 2018 general election. Anything that's even a, a moderate shade of purple is 60% or higher. So that includes the entire Austin city limits, which is on the left, as you can see how it voted for Prop B. You got a full third of the city that voted Democratic in the 2018-2020 elections and voted heavily, and we're talking 80-90% in some precincts for Proposition B. Uh, very uh, much the case here that this is as much as we want to say, okay, it's the Republicans that did this. They got a whole lot of Democrats. They would not have passed Prop B without a lot of Austin Democrats, mostly wealthy Austin Democrats, voting for this horrible proposition. All right, and then the next slide. So this was a, the, basically the history of, of the vote. And after two or three years of just a constant campaign by the Hope Not Handcuffs Coalition, we were able to get the city council to decriminalize homelessness in Austin and remove the regressive no sit, no lie law that had pre prevented camping or even made it illegal to sit and lie downtown, uh, you know, which was only targeted towards homeless people and not, you know, drunk uh, rat guys on 6th Street. And then the very next year, Save Austin Now began a petition drive, which failed because we aggressively countered it and they also were not very good at what they were doing. So they were not able to collect the 25,000 valid signatures. Though six months later, they tried again, um, you know, uh, just after Christmas, they really ramped it up. 
and they were able this time to pay enough canvassers to come in and lie to voters. Uh, they were telling people mm -hmm. that they would help homeless people, that they were going to get them into housing, uh, that they were going to provide services for them through Proposition B. All Proposition B did, as it was approved, uh, was recriminalized being homeless in Austin. Uh, you cannot camp anywhere in the city uh, within sight. Uh, police can cite you for that, and then they can issue an arrest warrant if you can't pay it, which most houseless folks cannot do. And also, it is now illegal once again to sit or even lie anywhere from about 30th Street down to the river and over into Central East Austin. Okay, next slide, please. So um, historical materialism in a map form is basically showing you like the roots of this inequality that you've already begun to see on these maps. Uh, quote by one of my favorite uh, leaders in the 20th century, Thomas Sankara, inequality can only be done away with by establishing a new society. That's obviously what we want to do. And what this presentation is, is kind of showing a material and political analysis of our city so that we can maybe start to use that information in toward our organizing as we go in, especially into the next year and the next election cycle and beyond. Next slide, please. So on the left is the Prop B vote. On the right is a map of 2015 medium family income in the city of Austin. There is a very obvious pattern here. I think you can notice it. Um, so, uh, oh, and Richard in the chat asked if there was like a f response following the first uh, failed signature drive. Uh, San tried to sue the city of Austin uh, for, um, oh. for, uh, for uh, supposedly, uh, you know, like uh, is basically this like the big lie sort of thing where like they said they they like rigged it. But reality is they were just really bad at collecting ballot signatures. Well, what I was asking was was there any response DSA to the first failure? Oh. How, how did DSA respond to that? Uh, well, we, we just re regrouped because uh, they started in the very next petition drive and we tried to do the same thing. Uh, this time they had a lot more money and they were paying canvassers to go left and right. And they were also lying a lot more on the, on the uh, you know, uh, some of our, one of our YDSA uh, students, uh, Bennett Burke caught, uh, caught one of them lying on campus and actually got chased and threatened by the guy. Uh, so basically, yeah, um, it's just, uh, we just try, we, it's just been a, a three or four year battle with these guys and, you know, we got a big victory and this is sort of the empire strikes back, I guess, sort of a moment <laughs> for us, but we're, we're still, we're still, we're gonna, we're gonna fight back. We're gonna, gonna we're gonna get this shit off the book somehow. <laughs> so, uh, also, uh, yeah, an ABC pest control, you see them everywhere, their billboards, the, the, the catchy jingle on the radio and TV. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the guy who owns that was a cut a $25,000 check to the save Austin now campaign. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, you'll notice here one exception here, looking at Southeast Austin, uh, Dove Springs, one of the most like lower income uh, areas of the city, a lot of immigrant families, a lot of like, uh, it's a largely Hispanic area. Uh, it, you can notice that Prop B actually passed in that part of Southeast Austin, uh, south of Ben White. So obviously they don't have the same interest to vote for this as people in West Austin did, but the key is here, there was much lower turnout and again, Sands' campaign was 50 billboards, a bunch of YouTube ads, and and people like you know their token Democrat uh, Cleo Petrasek coming on and saying that they were going to help homeless people and move them to where they can get help. So it's you know, it's one of those things where when you have so much propaganda and you have two million dollars behind it in a single city, and it's, and you can only counter that by you know, like. Uh, you know, uh, like direct contact because and, and things like that. Uh, it's very difficult. And it's also really easy to maybe to think that people could be voting for this out of the goodness of their hearts. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to, you know, lump like working class people in Southeast Austin who, you know, like in with the people who not only voted for this, but a, a donation map uh, show that the uh, precincts and zip codes that were donating to the Save Us Now campaign were all in West Austin, the highest, the highest the donors. And uh, with uh, one exception, one was Sun City up in Georgetown. There were a lot of retirees that voted. Um, they were good and comfortable and are, are, you know, don't seem to want anyone else to have that. But this is going to get into what we talk about at the end is the analysis, uh, the analysis of where we need to organize. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that very soon, but keep this map in mind and keep what I just said about Dust Springs and Southeast Austin in mind when we get to that point. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, Prop B did pass in some lower income precincts. 
their turnout was very low in these areas, as I mentioned. It's not where the bulk of the Prop B votes or donations came from, but it's still consequential. It's still factored into the margin. Uh, we don't have the citywide working class, multiracial working class uh, organization level yet to, to really coordinate a counter campaign to well-funded reactionaries. And that's not anyone's fault. It's just the material and political reality of our current situation. Um, Save Austin Now's dishonesty likely contributed to some support within working class constituencies. It's a, uh, and also, you know, um, with, with, uh, with uh, Austinites in general uh, that didn't have as much information and, and got most of the information about this campaign from the, from the commercials or from the narrative about, you know, just cleaning up encampments rather than all of the uh, just barbaric ways that this enforces uh, basically a removal policy on homeless Austinites from downtown and, and adjacent neighborhoods. So anyway, uh, we can go to the next slide. Thanks again, Subu. So originally, this inequality that you see on uh, is baked into the Austin 1928 city plan. Uh, this has been mentioned before, but it should be mentioned a lot. Uh, you can see the literal red lines on this map where uh, black people and people of color in general were required to live in certain neighborhoods of Austin. Uh, they, many, uh, they were originally established in Freeman's colonies in Clarksville and West Central Austin and other areas, but Gradually, there was a essentially a forced removal by denial of services and through you know intimidation and threats to force all African American people in Austin to the east of what is now I-35, and then I-35 was built over East Avenue to serve as a, a literal apartheid barrier uh, through the center of Austin. And to this day, you can see it on maps to the right. That is a uh, that is a race and ethnicity breakdown map of Austin of like who generally lives where. Each dot represents a person generalized within a census block. Uh, so you can see uh, green is a lot of the, this was from 10 years ago. And so what's gonna be interesting is when the 2020 census data is comes out at this detailed level, we're going to be able to see just how badly gentrification has happened in East Austin because 10 years ago, um, these more inner central East Austin areas were still largely black and Hispanic. But as we know now, a lot of wealthy white transplants have moved into those areas. A lot of tech companies have established their headquarters over there. Oracle just built along Town Lake, et cetera. Um, so you can see how the map on the left and for the map on the right, but when it comes to displacement, that is that burden it often falls on the people who are already living in the parts of the cities that they were required to be that their you know grandparents and sometimes parents were required to live in. Um, also interesting up north, you can see there's been a lot, of, and this has increased a lot since the last 10 years, but there's a lot of Asian uh, communities in farther north Austin. And the area around Runberg and Lamar, north of 183 and I-35 there, as you can see, it's all orange and red. And uh, that is just in a very diverse area of Austin now that, you know, in the 80s and 90s was considered suburban. So even in 2010, you could start to see like the patterns of displacement and uh, people being pushed out of the city, uh, even further north there towards Pflugerville. And then of course in Dove Springs, you can see the bright orange area at Southeast Austin where Prop B actually succeeded with a very low turnout. Thank you, that's all, thank you. I can see your cursor, perfect. Uh, so anyway, next slide, please. The uh, life inspection map I don't have here, but it, uh, Josh mentioned in the chat, but it definitely like follows that pattern, the, the economic pattern very, very directly. So uh, here's a good map, a good way to map gentrification is single family demolitions. Now you have to apply this differently in West Austin where rich people are just buying already nice houses, knocking them down and building McMansions. Uh, however, when you get to East Austin, it's a different story. A lot of these houses are being purchased where uh, people who were unable to pay the property taxes anymore and had to move out. Uh, people who had lived in those homes maybe for generations. Um, you know, Maybe they're being demolished to build lofts and condos. Uh, various, you know, various reasons for that. Also the same as the case in South Austin, uh, where you can see a cluster of these single family home demolitions. Uh, that area also used to be a very working class part of Austin as recently as the 1990s. And uh, there's Section 8 housing in that area still, despite the fact that now it's surrounded by homes that are easily worth an average of a million dollars. Uh, that area has changed dramatically. East Austin is all in that, like, East Austin is going into that, uh, that direction as well. And then, you know, as you go further out, uh, there's not so many demolitions. Uh, Leah mentioned in the chat, Leah mentioned in the chat that like uh, 
they look like Scandinavian barns. It's something I've noticed is like, you know, I used to think that those big blocky houses were tacky and, and, and crappy, but I personally have a vendetta about the architecture now of gentrification housing where there's just these big pointy houses everywhere that are all painted white or black, usually white with black trim or black with like gray trim. And that's it. They, it's a very like, there is sort of like a, there's a real uh, visual, uh, like sort of an invasion of like capital in Austin that is manifesting itself in many different ways. And uh, Dawn mentioned too that a lot of that single family housing in East Austin isn't being replaced with more dense housing or, or you know, lower income housing or, work, or, or affordable housing. It's being replaced simply with a bigger house that is three times as large and, you know, uh, instead of a lot with a small house worth five or six hundred thousand dollars, you now have a one point seven million dollar house just sitting there on East 12th Street. Okay, five or seven minutes, I should be able to do that. Next slide, please. All right, and then here is the real kicker, uh, talking about how much pressure the working class in Austin, the multiracial working class in Austin is under. On the left, medium family income in 2000, same color scheme. On the right, median family income in 2015. This is just 15 years. You can look there at what happened in downtown. You can look that West Austin got richer. And it's not that East Austin also got less poor, it's that East Austin got displaced. And you can definitely notice this pattern of like, again, wealth flooding into Austin, uh, flooding in a very direct way. And then again, when you look at the Save Austin Now voter, voter list, it's all venture capital firms with trying to fund tech startups here and uh, real estate companies and construction companies. They just simply need the poor out of the way. And it's not just, you know, they've come for homeless people right now, but they're, they're coming for everyone. We have to, you know, again, organize the working class, the multiracial working class together in Austin, I think, to fight against this. Uh, it's very, very clear what is happening. And this is just, again, 15 years. This is a extremely dramatic change in income uh, groups across Austin. You can really see what I was talking about in South Austin, whereas in 2000, it was still a largely working class area. And now you have, you know, uh, some uh, census tracts where people are averaging over $100,000 a year. Hey, thanks, Crystal. Thanks for coming. No worries. All right. And now looking ahead. So we're going to have a discussion now the rest of the time. It's an open discussion. Of course, you can talk about anything. However, on the uh, I've got some four topics kind of off of this. And I, I majored in geography and I know I know Austin real well, so I will stick around for the discussion, of course. And if you have any more questions about other maps or different things or, or just more information, I hopefully would be able should be able to provide that. So a couple of four just suggested discussion points. Uh, feel free to discuss however you want, just kind of getting you thinking in this direction. Um, so looking at that map of Prop B, uh, we can see who our enemy, who can we see who our enemies were and who our potential allies were, of course. You know, we're looking at a lot of people that on election day all voted for the same person, but they seem to have very, very on primary day anyway. We've seen that very, very different prod, uh, priorities and concerns when it comes to poverty in Austin. And also, uh, you know, the votes for Prop B uh, really did uh, mirror the percentages for the transit bond for the affordable housing bond, which West Austin also rejected in their in their wisdom. Um, that's a quotation marks there. So also, and then the second point is how does Austin's historical and current racial and economic segregation complicate socialist organizing today? And that alone could be like, you know, a like, a, a, you could have a conference over that question, but you know, we've got an hour tonight <laughs> to talk about it along with other things. And then also like, I've, I've kind of, you know, obviously <laughs> right, talking down on West Austin here in a lot of ways, but like, is there anyone still out there we could organize with? like? And I can answer that question too later on, but think about it, you know, should we just stay east of Mopac as DSA and only organize over here? Or should we consider, you know, that there are there are people out there that could be amenable to our politics? It's a valid question. And then finally, how do we bring in currently underorganized communities into a growing multiracial working class mass political movement? especially thinking about, again, like the diverse regions of far north Austin, uh, where, you know, there isn't too much north of Greg, once you get north of Greg's district, there doesn't seem, I think, in my opinion, to be uh, too much interaction with our chapter uh, and with our coalition as much. And then when you get into southeast Austin and Dove Springs or, or south William, you know, William Cannon and south first area, those areas down there, working class, uh, predominantly Latinx communities, uh, 
how can we organize with these groups? What are the things we need to do in order to build our coalition so that again, because the only way we're going to be able to defeat West Austin money and venture capitalists, Silicon Valley money and real estate money and capitalists in general who are coming to wage class warfare on our city, on the people of Austin uh, and you know the identity of this city and pushing people out for profit and for, for it to be their own playground. Uh, how do we fight back? How do we do that? How do we build the kind of mass movement? And also, you know, I mean, a good answer, of course, is unions uh, would be would play a big role in that if we had more union density, which currently it's still a very low percentage of Austin. But since we need to build that, since we need to build all these other things, uh, who, how do you think we can do that? So those are my main discussion points. Uh, I really appreciate everyone who came today. Um, I know I feel like I'm rambling on, but hopefully that this was a uh, that this was a uh, productive and uh, I hope to have a good discussion uh, with everyone. And these will be things that we'll be grappling with, I think, in the coming you know months and years as well, not just today.